Good morning, everybody. This is the cycle of uh, seminars from the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalusia. And today we will have the talk by uh, Dr. Yolanda Jimenez Teja. And she will talk about unveiling the dynamical stage of massive clusters of galaxies, the intracluster light. So as a brief introduction of uh, Dr. Jolly, she, she, is a, a, she has he, her mathematical degree in University of Cadiz in 2003, then the Master of Geodesy, Geophysics and Vulcanology, Ooh, interesting, also in University of Cadiz in 2006. Then the doctor, the doctorship in physics and mathematics uh, here at the IAA in 2011. And then she started a postdoc uh, by the Junta de Andalusia from 2012 to 2013. Then she moved to Brazil as a postdoc, Jóvenes Talentos, in the program Ciencia Sin Frontera in Brazil at the uh, Observatorio Nacional in Rio de Janeiro. And she was there. Uh, from 2014 until 2016 as a postdoc. Then she moved to another postdoc as a postdoc, not a, uh, not a days, not a 10, excellent postdoc under the Fundación de Amparo y Pesquisa do Rio de Janeiro, also in the Observatorio Nacional do Rio de Janeiro. And now she is uh, here at the IAA under a postdoc individual fellowship, uh, Marie Curie. Uh, she started here in 2020. Okay, uh, last, last but not uh, least, she uh, received a prize. Uh, sorry, I want to share my screen. Uh, she's a, it's a very important prize because she accepted the lollipop prize <laughs> for her dedication to the seminar. So thank you very much, Jolly, for accepting this invitation and the motivation for doing that. <laughs> um, I think uh, you can uh, start your talk. Thank you. Okay, let me share my screen because I'm now out or at least I'm seeing your screen, not mine. Um, uh -huh. Let me see. Uh, okay, I'll open here again. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So yes, so I don't know if you can see my see me, my 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 young face. So here it is a lollipop. <laughs> I don't know if I really earned it or it's just surprise that Rene couldn't um, stop giving me because I'm pregnant. So uh, I think that is very difficult to say no to, <laughs> to, to give a candy to a pregnant woman, but it's okay. <laughs> and it's always a pleasure uh, to give a, a talk here at home at the IAA uh, this time. I like to talk about um, my, my last work, my last accepted work um, that was entirely uh, made with the with foundings by the European Commission within the frame of the Marie Curie program in the H 2020 um, context. And it's about um, the relation between the dynamic, dynamical stage of massive galaxy clusters and the intercluster light uh, joining our knowledge about that with the with the uh, power of the relics data. So um, to start from the beginning, um, what, what is it, uh, this, this inter intercluster light? So the, the intercluster light um, is a component of the galaxy clusters, also groups, 
that um, that is not uh, very taken into account when we talk about uh, these these systems of, of galaxies. Um, traditionally, we always say that uh, a, a cluster of galaxies is composed by the galaxies themselves, um, dark matter, and also hot uh, hot gas. But there is a fourth component that is the intercluster light, which is this uh, in this very beautiful picture, picture of Virgo by by, Mi by Mijos. The intercluster light would be this this faint, very low surface brightness uh, light that is um, colored in an orangish uh, tone, and which is like is spread all over the cluster and is surrounding all the galaxies there in the cluster. It is defined uh, formally as the luminous components made by these stars that are um, caught by the gravitational potential of the, of the cluster, by, but these this stars do not belong to any, to any galaxy in the cluster. So these stars are, li are like free, they don't, uh, have a uh, host galaxies to belong to, but um, they are they suffer the potential of the cluster. Uh, this ICL is very important. It, it's 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 estimated that it can um, it can make it can make up to uh, fifty percent of the optical light of the total cluster, but um, it has remained almost unstudied. Um, for for many years, but uh, there was like a bump, a burst in the in the in the in the ICL in the I studies, like 15, 20 more years ago, more more or less. Um, so why is important this the light from these three stars? Um, first, because is is uh, their mechanisms, its mechanisms of, of formations. A formation is uh, intimately linked to the hierarchical process of operation of the cluster. So knowing the characteristics of the ICL can give, can give us insights about the processes that govern uh, the formation and evolution of the clusters. Also, to understand the metal enrichment of the intercluster gas, we do know that there is a lot of metals in the in the intercluster medium that cannot be explained a lot with the star formation rates in, in galaxies and the and the processes that move these metals to the inter, intercluster medium. But if we take into account the ICL is like the number much much better. Uh, also the ICL it's very important to constrain uh, cosmological parameters as, for example, the omega matter. Uh, we do know that if we calculate the value of fraction uh, or in clusters just using gas, although the gas represents the majority of the variance in the clusters, it's not enough to, to, to match or to be more consistent with the, the cosmological parameters uh, calculated by other independent proofs. Um, we also know that um, some supernovae have been found in the in the intercluster uh, light, uh, which can also help to this to the to the to the metal um, knowledge of the intercluster medium. And um, in general. Uh, the intercluster light is also important for people that is not interested in the, that are not interested in intercluster light. Like for example, people that needs to know very precisely uh, the photometry of the galaxies in a cluster or the morphology, etc. Um, where does this intercluster light that, uh, in short, I, I'll, I'll so, sometimes uh, call it ICL for short. Um, so where does this ICL come from? So um, mainly there are four mechanisms uh, uh, that would be the, the violent relaxation after major mergers, uh, especially with the, with the VCG, although not, not only with the VCG. 
Also, the tidal stripping of luminous, luminous galaxies uh, that are orbiting uh, within the cluster. Um, also, the disru disruption, total disruption or shredding of dwarf galaxies. That is a mechanism, uh, a mechanism that can produce a lot of ICL at higher uh, at high radius um, or high distances from the center of the cluster. Uh, finally, in situ star formation, although um, this is not a very very um, important mechanism, as it is supposed to contribute just with an one percent of the of the formation of the to the of the ICL. Um, um, depending on the main mechanism of, of formation for the ICL, uh, the resulting uh, ICL or, or the stars that will compose this ICL uh, will have very different properties, like different colors, uh, gradients in colors, in metallicity, in age, or not. And those properties will, would be more or less uh, similar to those of the stars in the in the galaxies of the of the cluster. Um, here, I'd like to show you a very very nice simulation by Rudik Michos and McBride, where we can see several of these mechanisms acting together. So um, I repeat uh, the simulation. So as the galaxies interact, then uh, it short uh, with each other and um, the two subclusters that we see in the simulation um, merge, we see how more and more stars are, are stripped out into the intracluster uh, um, space, um, creating this cloud of, of, of gray areas that would be like the, like the intracluster light, the stars in the intracluster light. Um, so, okay, now we are convinced that the ICL is something uh, like a sexy topic to study. Um, we do know that it has been discovered, uh, uh, it was discovered by Zwicky in the 50s. So, how or why the ICL has remained and studied for at least 50, 60 years? until the last uh, 15, 20 years. So mainly for two reasons. First one, a technical problem. The ICL is very, very difficult to detect. It's very faint. It has a very low surface brightness. Uh, so we really need deep observations to really see the ICL and moreover, to measure it with a certain guaranteed uh, that the errors are not um, ridiculous. Um, also, analytical problems, which would be mainly two. Uh, first one is how can we disentangle the light of the stars that uh, 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 belong to the galaxies themselves from the light of the stars that belong to the ICL. So if we go back to this uh, color image of Virgo, um, uh, it's like uh, one couldn't say easily where a galaxy, let's say, ends, more or less, <laughs> let's say this ends uh, with quotation marks, um, where the ICL starts. Um, Moreover, a second, a second problem. Suppose that we have a good mechanism or a good algorithm to separate the light of the galaxies of any galaxy in the image from the ICL. Uh, it's the same for the VCG from the, for the brightest galaxy in the cluster. No, we do know that the ICL tends to concentrate as, as it follows the potential of the, the gravitational potential of the cluster, it tends to concentrate around the center of the potential of the cluster, which usually uh, coincides in a spatial in, in, in spatial projection with the VCG. So uh, most cases we see that the uh, the surface in projection, the surface of the VCG 
matches somehow the surface of the ICL. And moreover, if the VCG has an extended envelope, uh, it's not easy to determine the transition from this halo to the ICL, which usually occurs um, smoothly. So for all these reasons, it's very difficult, very, very complex to study the ICL, but we decided uh, but, oh, sorry, I think that I was about to forget. It's important to know that even um, this transition or this disentanglement is very difficult to, 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 to be done. It exists. Many, many people believe that uh, um, the ICL is just a continuation of the, of the extended, of the galactic halo of the VCGs. And um, that's not true, as, as, as Longobardi uh, proved in 2018. We, we can see here the velocity dispersion uh, profile for M87, the, the VCG at the Virgo, at the Virgo cluster. And here uh, she, she gathered um, uh, a lot of data from IFUs, uh, from the kinematics of globular clusters, ultra compact uh, dwarfs, uh, and planetary nebulae. Um, here we can see that the profile uh, follows a, a decreasing uh, trend. And if we consider all the tracers and all the data all together, the, the velocity dispersion starts to increase uh, with a very, very strong inclination. However, if we separate the, the tracers between, uh, if, we, if we split the tracers into those belonging to the ICL and those belonging to the galactic halo, we see that the galactic halo uh, behaves at, as expected and the, the excess in the velocity dispersion corresponds to the, to, the, to the ICL. So indeed, there are different components, different kinematic components. It's very difficult to separate them uh, using, uh, using photometry alone. The ideal case would be using uh, dynamics and dynamical data always. But of course, it's something that we don't usually have at hand. So we need to do what we can with the data that we have. Um, with the aim of uh, developing an algorithm uh, that uh, was um, uh, precise and free of uh, assumptions uh, about the ICL as is, um, as is typical surface, surface brightness or morphology, etc. Uh, we developed in 2016 an algorithm that we call CYCLE. CYCLE stands for CHEFS Intracluster Light uh, uh, Estimator. Um, in a nutshell, CYCLE uh, separates the ICL from the galactic light using essentially two tools, which are, which are the CHEFS and tools from differential geometry, tools of curvature. So let's give a brief look into this. So here we have an example. The first example that, that we first cluster that, that we analyzed, that is uh, the Pandora cluster, um, able 2744. And here you can see the original image as observed uh, by the Frontier Fields uh, program in the, in the 814 filter. So first thing that we did was removing the light of all galaxies by modeling them and using these models to remove uh, this contribution for the, for the image. How did we model the, the, each galaxy on the image? Using a tool that we developed in 2012 um, that is called CHEFS. CHEFS uh, is a mathematical orthonormal basis um, that is built using Chebyshev rational functions and Fourier series. There it comes name from Chebyshev and Fourier. Um, we showed that uh, joining these two analytical uh, set of functions, 
uh, in a certain way, we could, we could obtain a mathematical orthonormal basis that was very flexible, uh, ca capable of modeling uh, galaxies with any kind of morphology. And the only requirement is that uh, the object to be modeled is smooth enough. For example, we cannot model um, saturated stars or objects that are cut in the borders or, of an image or any kind of, or any kind of object that has a very sharp feature. Um, so uh, here to, to show an example of the, of the power of the chefs, uh, here we can see uh, a very detailed uh, galaxy and a, spy and a spitzer image uh, with a lot of detail of a, of a spiral galaxy. And here you can see the original image and this is the chef model. The points that are missing there are um, point-like sources, so maybe stars, uh, chefs, as I said, are unable to, to, to fit. And here you can see that the model is very, very precise. Maybe we can see some differences here in these outer areas, areas here, um, but in general, it perf they perform very, very well. So using chefs, uh, we remove, we model and remove all the galaxies in an image. But again, for the BCG, uh, we need to find this transition from the from the halo to the ICL in a different way because chefs alone are no, uh, uh, would model everything together without knowing where to stop the model. Let's let's say. So for the particular case of the BCG or the BCGs, as as seen in the Pandora cluster. We re-added the, the models of the of the of the VCG, the chef models, to leave that part, that region of the image completely untouched. And we uh, did a more thorough analysis of this of this region. What we did was, was analyzing, uh, analyzing sorry, the, the curvature of the composite surface uh, made by the VCG and the ICM. Which is the curvature? The curvature is um, a, char a characteristic of each point in a surface. Um, and it measures uh, like the change in the slope uh, that the surface uh, surf suffers in that exact point. Here we can see a toy model of a surface that has like a bump that is coming toward us. And here we can see four, ty four different types of curvatures that, um, that are very traditional, uh, very well known in differential geometry. Uh, we can see that the minimum principal curvature um, um, is able to, to catch the, the shape of the, of the bump that is coming toward us in a, in a, in a very reasonable way. So we thought that maybe using this, this curvature parameter uh, uh, could help us to, to, to know where, um, where the limits of the VCG dominated area are. And Indeed, we, we did the, the, the exercise with the Pandora cluster. Here you could see the, the curvature map, uh, the principal minimum, principal minimum curvature map, and the, the points here, in the, the curve of or the curves of blue points here would be um, the, the, the points where the curvature, the curvature changed. Uh, most well, that would be the, the points where this transition occur, occurs. And finally, we uh, remove the contribution of the VCG, but constrained to the limits of these blue lines. Um, we use simulations to see if the, is this purely geometrical approach was, was reasonable. And uh, we um, we created models and simulations of, of, of clusters with different uh, configurations for the BCG and the ICL. 
Uh, here you can see three examples where the VCG is plotted in, in red and the ICL in, in blue. So we started from what is um, obtained as the average cluster in the redshift range from 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 as, as found by CVT and collaborators. And um, for this average cluster in this interval of, of redshift, the, the, um, the error committed by, by, by cycle is very, very close to zero, a very, very low error. As we increase the complexity of the of uh, to find this transition from the BCG to the ICL dominated areas, like making the ICL and the BCG more and more similar and with uh, more similar slopes, um, the, um, the error increase, the error in the determination of this transition um, is higher, of course. And when the VCG and the ICL are very, very close, are very similar, we found we found a uh, total error of a 10%. From that point, the, the error is strongly raises. Um, uh, uh, and for example, for, for, these, for these configurations, it would be completely impossible for cycle to find the transition, not only for cycle, for any, for any algorithm, uh, because here we can see that the, that the ICL is completely embedded uh, inside the, the VCG. So it would be like a very, very uh, theoretical and impossible case to, to analyze. Um, here, I'd like to show you another exercise that we did, did with, the, with a BGG that would be the brightest galaxy in, the, in a subgroup in the Virgo cluster, that is M49. Uh, we knew that uh, the, the transition from the, IC, from the VCG to the ICL was uh, determined uh, using tracers uh, kinematically, um, uh, specifically using planetary nebulae. So um, we applied cycle to this, to this galaxy in Virgo, and we found, uh, first we found that the ICL um, let's say underlying underlining uh, this this VCG was not homogeneous, but it had uh, like two uh, brighter regions on the north and um, more or less on the south, and um, and we found that the, the average radius of the of the VCG dominated region radius uh, region would be around 20, um, 41 kiloparsecs. Comparing that with uh, the, the work of Hart uh, and, collaborat and collaborators, we saw that uh, they also identified two brightest, uh, two regions or two quadrants with brightest, brighter uh, planetary nebulae exactly matching uh, with the brighter areas of the ICL that Cycle had found, what um, made us very, very happy and very, very shocked when, when we saw that. Um, also, they determined uh, probabilistically the uh, transition uh, from the VCG to the ICL um, as something in between, more or less, it would be like the, the, the crossing of the points with this horizontal <laughs> line, and that would be around, I don't know, 55, 53 kiloparsecs, which is pretty consistent with our measurements considering the error bars. So it seems that cycle works um, when compared to, to kinematical analysis. It seems that it, that is also consistent. So we decided to apply uh, cycle to a, a higher sample of 11 clusters, all of them observed by the HSD, mainly from, from CLASH and the Frontier Field uh, programs. Um, uh, they had in common that they were all massive. Uh, spanning the redshift inter interval between more or less 0 0.2 to 0 0.55. And they all have 
uh, had their dynamical stages uh, very well defined by different proofs, like for example, the X-ray distribution and morphology, the presence or not of a cool core, the distribution of velocities of the galaxies, the presence or not of radio halo, halos and radio helix, and presence of substructure, for example. And in this work that uh, we, we did in 2018, uh, we did four things that were uh, completely uh, different from what is what what was usually done um, previously uh, uh, up to that day. Um, first, we use cycles uh, instead of any other technique to, to separate the, the ICL. Also, we split the sample into relaxed uh, or passive and merging clusters, which is something that it, it wasn't very taking into account when in the, in the previous studies of the ICL. We also decided to measure the ICL fraction. The ICL fraction is the ratio between the flux in the ICL and the total flux of the, of the cluster. So we decided to measure the ICL fraction in different wavelets. Previous works in the literature uh, were us usually limited to one or two uh, filters, that's all. But we decided to use more filters. And another difference is that we measure the total ICL fraction. We were not restricted to a fixed, a fixed radio, like for example, a certain fraction of the, of the, of the, um, of the video and radios or something similar to that, that. But we measure the ICL up to the limit where we can detect it safely. Um, if the if the is is like comparing um, in a galaxy in aperture magnitude versus a total magnitude. So this is exactly the same, but with the with the ICL. And doing this this work, we saw uh, that uh, here we put all the ICL fractions that we measure in the for these eleven clusters. Uh, we measure the ICL fraction in three different optical filters of the HST. Um, uh, we put all the results in the rest frame. Um, we saw that for the subsample of relaxed clusters, that um, is a subsample with markers uh, colored in blue, uh, the ICL fractions that we found were, um, were um, lower and they were nearly constant within the, the error bars. However, for the subsample of merging clusters, which are the, the symbols in, in red, we found that the ICL fractions were uh, significantly higher, a factor of 2.3 on average higher than, than those of the relaxed clusters. Um, and also, um, they weren't constant. By they they showed this peak that it was uh, like from three uh, three three thousand five hundred uh, Armstrongs to more or less um, four thousand eight hundred Armstrongs. Um, the explanation that we found in our in this work of two thousand nineteen for this was that. Um, for the subsample of relaxed clusters, the, ice, the main mechanisms of ICL was the tidal um, uh, stripping of the, of, the, of the galaxies that were passively evolving uh, within the cluster, orbiting towards the center of rotation of, of the cluster. So at the end, the populations of the ICL and the, and the, um, and the um, galaxies, the member galaxies, somehow um, matches um, uh, the, the ICL fraction, which is like this relation between the, the stars in the ICL and the stars in the total cluster, somehow were constant uh, along different wavelengths. However, for the subsample of merging clusters, there is like an enhancement in the ICL fraction that is provoked by the, by the merger itself. So there is this additional um, contribution of stars that are freed into the, liberated into the ICL, uh, originated, originated by, the, by the merger itself. Um, especially 
uh, it is seen that younger or lower metallicity stars uh, contribute to the to the ICL to form this peak at this as the at these wavelengths. We later uh, confirmed by with a, a, a work by by Morishita and collaborators in two thousand and 17 that the uh, for the frontier so for the frontier fields clusters uh, which are all mergers um there was an excess of a and a type stars in the icl which uh, so and we here plot the wavelet wavelet wavelength intervals where the emission peaks of these stars are more or less located. And we saw that more or less this uh, was consistent with the peak that we saw analyzing the, the ICL fraction alone. So um, we were very happy with this, um, with this uh, result. And we decided to, um, be, to do a larger uh, study. Uh, this 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 work were, it was uh, fully funded by by the European Commission, as I said, and um, the main idea was uning uh, or, or so it was joining the the power of cycle with the power of relics. Relics is um, have a multi treasure program, uh, a multi orbit program. Sorry, that uh, has observed. For, uh, 41 uh, galaxy clusters uh, with HST um, and high quality data. Um, so all of them are massive. So it's uh, the same that, that we had for our previous sample of 11 cluster, uh, clusters and they span the redshift interval between 0 0.2 to almost one. So uh, the idea is studying the, the evolution of the ICL with redshift. Um, we have started with the cluster WHL as uh, 0137, uh, which is a redshift 0.56, so which is at the high end of our redshift interval that we studied before. Um, these relics data uh, were the first ones uh, for for these clusters for this cluster with with HST. Uh, this cluster is very 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 interesting because it has a lens arc of about um, fifteen arc second long, which makes it the longest arc. Uh, at redshift higher than six. And it is also interesting for many other things that uh, will be published soon in a, in, a, in a paper by Brian Welch and collaborators, stay tuned. Um, as this cluster was uh, so interesting, we had uh, many filters to work with, with a lot of, with enough depth to see the ICL. So we had, Nine bands in total for in the in the um, in the optical and five in the infrared, and here you can see uh, the original well a color composite image of the of the cluster and a color composite image of the ICL after this uh, cluster was cycled or or was processed by cycle. Um, uh, here you can see how the how the ICL nicely uh, nicely um, extends around the, the the main core of the of the cluster. Uh, um, it's a smoothness and its its colors. And uh, also we measure the ICL fraction at these uh, different wavelengths. Here you can see the same plot as before, but here we have added the new uh, black points, which corresponds to the to the cluster WHL zero one six three seven. First, we saw that going to the optical, the the points nicely follows the peak as, as the previous uh, merging cluster. So we determined that this should be a merging cluster also. 
And uh, later we uh, we uh, saw that that was consistent was with the with uh, the X-ray distribution of the cluster, which also show that this this is um, a merging cluster. And um, uh, another thing, new thing that we did was um, was um, a going to the infrared that is something that we, we haven't we hadn't done before so we didn't have uh, results in the infrared to anchor our new results about this cluster so uh, first thing that we noticed is that the icl fractions in the east in the in the infrared were uh, significantly higher than those in the optical and at first we were puzzled and we thought that it, that could be that could be the the result of any kind of systematic that was affecting our measurement so we ruled out a bunch of possible systematics like for example uh, the contribution of the of the contamination by the zodiac light and the earth shine we we checked that the observational strategy followed with this cluster was good enough to um, to minimize the possible effect of this of this of this um, contamination also even even though the observational uh, strategy was uh, was very good we we compare our measured uh, backgrounds for the for this image with the with models of the zodiacal light um, and we saw that there was no trend between the the, the two measurements so that mean that meant that the um, the, the images uh, were indeed free of this possible contamination uh, we also checked if the images could be suffering uh, from some persistence. Persistence. So, um, Borlaff and, collaborator, and collaborator, uh, collaborators showed that for um, the the wide field camera three, the infrared uh, camera of in, in the HSD, um, the persistence is an effect that can highly affect. Uh, the studies of low surface brainness uh, sources. Uh, persistence is when, when, when some light from previous observations remain in, in the detector, so they appear somehow in, in observations afterwards. Um, however, uh, we we calculate models uh, with a lookback time of 96 hours to see if this could be affecting our observations, and the answer was no. And the possible um, effect was completely uh, negligible of 0.002 percent for the for the worst filter, and also. Uh, following Borlaff and collaborators, we calculated uh, new flats for our images. Uh, we calculated uh, sky flats and compared them with the official mass flats. Um, uh, we we sh we indeed saw that our newly uh, newly uh, reduced images were flatter than the than those provided by the official mast pipeline. Uh, these are um, uh, for comparisons between the official reduction and the new reduction. The differences are not very significant for the infrared. They are uh, for for the optical. We can see how the new uh, the new reduced data is flatter and in fact it preserve, preserves more the icl is not so aggressive it, it doesn't um, misidentify um, the the background with the or the sky with the icl as much as the uh, official mast pipeline does but um, considering that we are measuring the ICL fraction in, he, in its whole extension and not limited like by a small radius, and that also that we are um, using the ICL fraction, which somehow dilutes, somehow dilutes the, the, the effect 
of these of these of these flat um the the maximum difference of the or the maximum error that we found in the icl fractions considering the new flats was as high as 1.26 percent for the for the worst filter so again this this wasn't this wasn't an issue for to explain our higher um infrared icl fractions so uh, we try to see if uh, maybe dust reddening could be playing some a, ro a role there in these higher, in these enhanced um, redder ICL fractions. Uh, we first um, checked that galactic and intergalactic dust contribution was very low because the WHL0137 is far from the galactic plane. Um, and also, even if if this contribution were uh, significant, significant, that would enter as a multiplicative term into the ICL fraction, because it equally affects to the ICL and the and the other galaxies and the and the gal member galaxies of the cluster. So it would be cancelled out. Um, also, we thought that maybe intercluster dust was uh, reddening the intercluster stars. But uh, this dust um, is not expected to survive uh, in the ICL much more than uh, a few thousand years. Um, and its contribution would be very, very would be negligible, uh, especially at the, at the very near infrared. So it's, it's ruled out also. We also checked if uh, cold gas filaments originated from warm galactic outflows uh, could be contributing with some dust because we know that this dust can can weather this put it this put in depending on the on the size of the the grain but even if this effect was present it would be confined to a scale of tens of kiloparsecs that for a cluster that is a zero a redshift 0 0.5 is again negligible we couldn't see that so it seems that these uh, icl fractions with these very high icl fractions are for real um that we, what we are seeing here is a mix of uh, stellar components in the ICL. We, in the ICL, we can see a bluer component that is intimately linked to the emerging dynamical stage of the cluster. Uh, so these are stars that are fueled into the ICL due to the tidal stripping of the infoling galaxy, high speed encounters uh, due to the merger and the total dis disruption of dwarf galaxies. While there is a redder, uh, no redder population, but there are redder stars that are that maybe were put there at, at higher redshifts during the process of formation of the of the cluster itself. Or maybe these are just ICL stars, uh, all uh, past ICL stars that are aging. Or, or, or maybe these are stars that are stripped by, from, the, from the extant passive uh, galaxies that belong to the cluster as they evolve towards the center of potential. Or it can be even ICL that is pre-processed in groups, in falling groups that are uh, going, emerging in, with, the, with the cluster itself. We know that this ICL pre-processed in groups um, it should be redder. Um, and in fact, we do know that um, as, the, as the interactions uh, within the group um, uh, um, strip out stars, um, and the group falls into the cluster potential, the ramp pressure stripping is increased, um, and somehow the, the, uh, it, it appears some, some regions with uh, soon H2 regions, um, and this appeared in, in, the, in the reddest parts of, the, of our, of our uh, wavelength interval. Um, also, 
it could be the, the presence of emission line nebulae. Also, this, this again would be a very minor effect confined to, uh, to, a, to a few kiloparsecs in the center of the, of the cluster, but it's, it's a possibility. And um, well, um, to sum up, um, we, we in past works uh, show that the ICL fraction, fraction can be used as an independent indicator of the dynamical state of the, of the clusters. Um, we know that uh, passive clusters or relaxed clusters have ICL fractions that are radically different from, from those in emerging clusters. Um, and we also, we uh, going to our last work on WHL0137, uh, we know that it can be classified as a merging cluster, uh, which is consistent with the X-rays, uh, going to the, on, or exploring the infrared, um, uh, we saw that the ICL must be a mixing of, of different type of stars and different mechanisms that are um, feeding the, the, the ICL uh, simultaneously. Uh, well, I didn't talk about this, but we also discovered that um, WHL0137 has the potential of becoming a fossil group. So it's considered, it would be considered a fossil group progenitor. And finally, I think that this, this work is very important because it's, it's, it's the first step to, to show that the relics data is very valuable to, for, for ICL studies and low brain surface uh, purposes. And um, well, we, we continue with our work in this, in this way. And um, thank you for your attention. Um, I'm open to questions. Thank you very much, Jolly, for this uh, nice uh, talk. And now the talk uh, is open for questions. Uh, please, uh, to the, all the people, raise your hand. For doing that, go to the reaction button at the bottom of the screen and then press there the rising hand icon. Okay, who will be the first? I give a lollipop for the first question. Oh, Florence. Okay, go on. Hello. Thank you for this lovely talk. I don't really need a lollipop, but uh, you can give it to Yoli for me. Perfect. I will do it. Um, I, I was interested by the fact that you find uh, more, um, a higher fraction of intracluster light in the infrared. We, we also found the same. In, um, in uh, one of the clusters that you mentioned here, which is MAX 0717. And there was an analysis that was done by my former PhD student, Amael Elian, and he developed a code to, um, to extract the ICL based on wavelets. And he applied it for, as a first uh, try um, to MAX 0717 in, in four ba um, HST bands. And so he didn't detect any ICL in the blue. And then in the, I think it was the 606, uh, 814, and then one of the infrared filters. And as you go redder, the uh, intracluster light uh, fraction increased. So are, are you going to do this for other uh, clusters as well in the infrared? Yes, yes, for sure. We do have um, the uh, infrared filters for for clash for clash data. Um, it's something that we just didn't do. I don't know. I I, I don't have a, an answer for for. No, I'm just asking if you are going to do if you plan to do it because uh, it would be nice to have the same result for a, a sample of clusters rather than just two. Yes, yes, for sure, for sure. Um, we are considering all the relics data, the, the relics sample, and uh, also the clash sample because they they all have all these this uh, panchromatic uh, uh, data of, of the clusters. Um, um, 
to give a flavor of our current uh, work. Now I'm studying, um, especially in the infrared, of, of course, um, the ICL fraction in the two highest redshift clusters in the redshift uh, in the relic sample, which are uh, more or less at 0 0.9. Ooh. So my intention is is a double is to see is this enhance of higher infrared is ICL fractions in the infrared um, still appear there, and also to see if this um, this um, behave or this difference between um, merging and relaxed clusters um, is ubiquitous or it only appears at redshift intermediate to, to, to lower redshifts. So that's how our current work, which is in, in, in process. Okay. Um, Very nice. We so we, we will be waiting for your results. <laughs> Thank you. If, 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 may I ask another question? Sure, go on. Okay, then you said uh, just at the end in the conclusions that WHL01 uh, uh, something uh, is um, may, may be the progenitor of a fossil group. And could you say why? Yes, uh, the point was that um, uh, as we calculate the CL fractions, uh, we need to, to perform some cluster membership. Um, for for the relics clusters, we don't have the generally spectra to calculate this this cluster membership. So we had the help of a collaborator with has which has who has um, um, a machine learning algorithm for classificating the the galaxies in a between cluster and between members and non members in a cluster. And when we were um, having a look at the at the color magnitude diagram, we noticed that the the, the magnitude of the VCG was um, rather far uh, from from those of the of the of the other cluster members. Um, so first, we checked if it follows followed the 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 criteria. To, to be a fossil group, the, the two magnitude uh, different in brightness with the second rank galaxy between the VCG and the second rank galaxy. And it didn't. But we um, followed previous works that um, made a huge, a, hu uh, a huge assumption, which is that um, the system is going to remain to remain um, isolated mm. uh, up to date, and that all the galaxies that has the potential to merge with the VCG in this look back time are going to uh, join their stars to the VCG and only the VCG, that no fraction of these stars are going to the, to the ICL, which we know that is a very huge assumption. Yeah, that's not true. Yes, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. But if we do the numbers and calculate with dynamics, um, how many of these galaxies have the potential to merge with the VCG and assuming that they will incorporate all their stars to the VCG after, after this look back time, um, this system would become a fossil group. So it has the potential of being a fossil group progenitor, which makes it even more interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you to you. OK, there is a question in the in the chat made by Wei Wang. If the high ICL fraction in the unrelaxed clusters than the relaxed clusters related to how the ICI is measured, um, not really in the sense that um, the algorithm is the same and also the radius used to measure the ICL fractions is essentially um, the limits that the own data impose. So um, it's not like as relaxed clusters 
have some kind of symmetry or are more concentrated in general. We are measuring uh, ICL fractions in a smaller radio, radii or, or in a different way. Um, uh, it, it shouldn't be a difference as, as we are uh, using total magnitudes. Um, it shouldn't be a difference between, between because we are using ICL fractions, which makes uh, lives easier um, because we are free of a lot of systematics that can affect another ICL measurements as for example, the effect of the, of the PSF or color radiance, etc. cetera. So um, in principle, there is no difference. In fact, uh, one, um, when, analy when analyzing uh, a merging cluster um, uh, that is a, a higher redshift, um, the, 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 how, how they look in the bluer bands, as, as Florence pointed, um, is very difficult. Uh, there, there is... Uh, very few ICL there, so each each kind is it's kind of similar to what we see in a relaxed cluster, and still the measurements, uh, the resulting measurements are radically different. So the answer should be no. Okay, thank you. I think the answer is uh, way one. Is if you want to add something, you can do it in the chat. Yeah, uh, may, may I directly speak? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, what I mean, the, the measurement uh, for the ICL is different. It's not uh, talking about your method. It's talking about uh, the intrinsic difference between those uh, modern clusters and the relaxed clusters. And you have said that uh, those, those stars from modern, stars, uh, modern clusters can be younger than the ICL stars uh, than those um, uh, in relaxed uh, clusters. And the other thing that comes to my mind is that if you uh, think about uh, the modern system and you, you may select those um, tails when these uh, um, galaxy merge together and you will see a tail of those um, uh, stars uh, uh, during this merge event. And um, is this set, uh, included in, I think, included in your ICL fraction? Is that right? Um, and the, in theory, uh, we are talking about theory that maybe those stars is uh, still uh, physically bonding to the modern galaxy. And uh, that is uh, what I'm talking about, the, the intrinsic uh, 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 difference between those uh, uh, different cluster, dynamical clusters and may have some effect on this measurement. Okay, I see, I see. Now I understand your, your question. So the point here is that it somehow it's tricky to, to, um, uh, to, inter to interpret the ICL fractions. The fact that we see a peak uh, for the emerging clusters doesn't imply that we have um, younger or lower metallicity stars in the ICL for merging clusters. And these stars are not present in the relaxed clusters. Mm -hmm. It means that the fraction or, or the amount of these stars in the ICL compared to the amount of these stars in the galaxies is higher. For, for merging classes, but they they exist, exist in the in the in the two situations. So, uh, for example, as pass as 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 the um, as the galaxies uh, passively evolve towards the center of potential of the uh, the potential of the cluster, they will they will lose the stars in the outer regions. Mm -hmm. These stars are mainly bluer uh, at this redshift range. And as they evolve towards, towards the VCG, um, the stars that they are losing are redder and redder. But um, somehow it's like the, 
the, the amount of these stars in the ICL, these bluer stars in the ICL, and the amount of these stars in, 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 in the galaxies balanced for, for passive clusters. But when you have a merger, there is an additional mechanism that mainly um, increase the fraction of bluer stars. Mm -hmm. So obviously the, the, the environment is provoking that the final ICL should be uh, bluer in the case of the emerging clusters or the gradient in color or age or metallicity should be steeper for merging clusters than for relaxed clusters, although this is an, an analysis that I haven't done, but it should be interesting to do. Uh, but what I, I, I want to, to say is that it's not that these passive clusters don't have bluer stars in the, IS, in, the IS, in, the IS, in the ICL, but the amount is more comparable to the, um, to the amount of these stars in the galaxies of the cluster. I see, I see your point. It's maybe more, uh, uh, more clear that if you show the, 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 the profile of the ICL, and then we can see that directly that uh, how this uh, um, sweeping effect uh, is actually uh, showing up in this SEL fraction. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. There is another question. Uh, Rosa, please go on. Hello, Jolie. Hello. Congratulations. Very nice talk. Um, well, I have a, a question related with the, the assumption that probably uh, you can explain the uh, intracluster fraction in the infrared by the presence of emission line. So you are talking about the uh, emission line by massive star or by planetary nebula or, or what? Or what kind of the contributor or tracer are you talking about? Yes, uh, the main mechanism that I consider to... to to, uh, to try to explain these, these higher ICL fractions um, was based on, on planetary nebulae. Uh, basically because uh, for, for, for galaxies um, in, in low redshift clusters, we can see this planetary nebulae. Uh, of course, for uh, such a high or intermediate uh, redshift cluster, we wouldn't see this this um, this contribution, but uh, still, their effect should be noticed somehow in these higher ICL fractions. Also, the ICL that is preprocessed in groups and is incorporated into the ICL as the as the group merge uh, with the with the cluster um present uh, present um, emission uh, h h um, h2 uh, regions of h2 h2 emissions and even it have it has been seen um, um h1 emission all of that would be appearing in the in the in the infrared um of course, I cannot quantify if this effect is is um, is the, the contribution or the proportion that this effect could have compared with with the others. Because I really think that the main mechanism of formation for these redder stars um, is it, it it occurs at at, at very much higher redshifts during the process of assembling of the of the VCG and the cluster itself at redshift one or even higher than one because the few works that we have in the, in the literature uh, showing the the ICL with very very high uh, redshift clusters 1.2 1.5 show a very considerable amount of ICL we can see a lot of ICL and, and high redshift and this is mainly red, very red. 
So I think that this is the main mechanism. But still, the other mechanisms should be uh, additioning something. OK, thank you. Thank you. Did you? Thank you, Rosa. Thank you, Jolly, for the answer. No more questions? I think it's, it's enough, and we can close the talk here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jolly, for this uh, wonderful talk. And to everybody, see you next talk next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony.